people. <sighs> right? Yeah, man. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, you gonna make it? I mean, right now I'm uh, I'm I'm closing Reddit. I'm closing Reddit so that like that's not on my screen. Yeah. Uh, you know, because that's just always there and like mm. because mm-hmm. because we all live in this moment where like per- like permanent noise is the is is what we've replaced consciousness with. Mm-hmm. See, the problem, Tom, is between the last time we recorded an episode and tonight, mm-hmm. I watched Too Hot to Handle, and we've already discussed this Ooh. as you know. Yeah. the normal friends we are but now we're podcast mm-hmm. friends now we're oh, now we're using God. our podcasting voices right and mm-hmm. to all of our loyal <laughs> listeners if you watch too hot to handle you will lose more brain cells than you would chugging a bottle of this delicious zinfandel that tom mm-hmm. and i are both drinking which is the 2017 yeah. sagacio family vineyards uh sonoma county just straightforward Zinfandel, which is fantastic. Yeah. Unlike I'm... the show Too Hot to Handle, <laughs> which is a flaming pile of dog shit that deserves to be one of the things we send out into space for aliens to find so that if they can find any sympathy in their hearts for us as a race, mm-hmm. they're benign when they show up, or they yeah. just decide that we need to be wiped off the map without some sort of like Independence Day contrivance where we actually know that it's right. about to happen and we just immediately right, get right. nuked. There you go. That's pretty great, actually. So what you're saying is that either as much of this material should be put out as possible, or we should just broadcast this as widely as possible. Um, or both. You know, this is one of those glorious moments where my opinion won't, like, I can just say sure, because... Mm-hmm. Dog shit like that is going to exist out in the world because it turns out there are complete industries founded upon yeah. people not caring and taking mm-hmm. advantage of the people that take in whatever it is they make. Right. Like, there are complete industries, or subsets of industries rather, where no passion or talent is rewarded. And you are specifically mm-hmm. rewarded only for how much you take advantage of your audience. And right. what's amazing is that this is actually my description of the wine industry as well. I'm not Mm. just talking about the show that I fucking hate. Because when someone says to you, reality TV, what do you think? Me personally? Sure. I don't, you know. Or, or, Uh, or a person generally, if you can, if you can put yourself into that fucking headspace. Hmm. Uh, I mean, like, I guess specific shows would depend on whatever your preferences or whatever bullshit. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, like so much of TV now is just reality shows. But yeah. well, fucking um, uh, American Idol was like the first huge one. I feel like, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I know, sure. that's, I mean yeah. that's a reality show to a certain extent. I don't know, yeah. but there's a zillion of them. It, well, if we're saying that, then I would say something like Jeopardy, or before that, Hollywood Squares. Like any game show falls then into mm. reality show. That's true. I'm thinking of a specific kind of reality show that I I credit with being created by the Kardashians out Mm. of the O.J. Simpson trial. Ooh, Which was a kind of watershed moment culturally because it was the first time something Mm -hmm. like that had happened. And there were Mm -hmm. these characters that came out of it, the Kardashians, that we've continued to follow. And we've been, we've had these insistences to continue to follow them uh, throughout their lifespan. Um you know, as in terms of cultural relevance, Kim Kardashian marrying Kanye, Kanye, um, and then uh, Caitlyn Jenner, you know, as a whole moment. And mm-hmm. what's wild about all of that to me is that it's created like that version of a reality TV show is very much dependent upon this other narrative that's going on where there are these big twists like that like kanye and caitlin to the narrative Mm -hmm. that that reality show like is able to use as these big moments but people watch the show when stuff like that isn't happening right people just Mm -hmm. watch the show and there are writers for that show like there's there's a there there is a script and that so basically what i was fishing for is like 
dishonesty as a response to reality TV because reality TV is inherently more dishonest than any fictional TV because it suggests Mm -hmm. that it is in some way documentarian. And a documentary starts with the lie that you're telling someone a truth. Whereas a fiction Mm -hmm. starts with the truth that you're telling someone a lie, right? Uh Uh-huh. And that's that becomes this whole fun epistemological thing that who gives a shit about it? But the thing about reality TV that is fascinating to me, especially in this moment we're living in, is that on the one hand from Netflix you have Tiger King, which is a genuinely fascinating insight into culture. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, <laughs> you have Too Hot to Handle, which is the most nihilistic dog shit that I have ever observed and makes me want to... Um, I don't know. I mean, it's camp at this point to say, do a fight club thing and blow up a bunch of skyscrapers, but Mm -hmm. um, it certainly makes me want to, like, walk naked onto the floor of the Senate and piss all over Mitch McConnell's face. I don't know. Something Mm. like that. And then just... Okay. uh, Or do that in the halls of NBC or ABC or whatever. Netflix. I don't give a shit. Anyhow, all of that said, when you say reality TV, that that is devoid of meaning, but the the inherent bias is towards that nihilism. Because you know, as a passive observer of culture or media, that reality TV is this, like, grotesque landscape so vast that you can't actually observe all of it, but that you will be informed about you will have you will have indications made to you about all that like you might not watch honey boo boo ever but if you watch south park you will learn about honey boo boo so you know yeah. fuck you you have to deal with that knowledge on some level and the thing about the nihilism the thing about like how it's created like on the one hand you have people like Trey Parker or Matt Stone who are like genuinely talented people who like are trying to do something with South Park that at times is completely derivative and pointless and shitty and at other times is like really interesting and then you have people on the other end of that who have no investment in their own artistic like personhood or vision who are just making a product to get something from their audience in completely quantifiable contexts and Mm -hmm. this all is a long-winded metaphor for how i understand zinfandel to be conceived of in the (laughs) wine culture because people take for granted that it's this just sort of bullshitty like thing that's meant to like please the masses but in reality like a lot of it is very manipulative and is just sort of taking advantage of like this drinking public who are like yeah i like red wine I don't want to know too much about it, but I can say the word Zinfandel, and it sounds complicated, and I've had several that I like, but the, you know, the, the presiding, the presiding, you know, um, I suppose, uh, mentality is that it is not, like, a high art form, Mm -hmm. and... I think that does a lot of discredit to the actual work that has to be put in by people who want to passionately make, you know, something that is genuinely, like, thoughtful and good and enjoyable, which um, this bottle of Zinfandel that we both happen to be able to be drinking is. Like, it's a great bottle of wine, and Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like, maybe there are a bunch of people out there in the world who want to tell me that I'm just basing all of what I'm saying on this wrong assumption that they have some beef with Zinfandel, but like, I genuinely think that it gets a bad rap just for not being like you know, something that some one region of France has pitched its entire like, uh, reputation around. Yeah. That was a very long, ambling (laughs) potentially pointless rant, and I really thank you for giving me the time for it. Uh, yeah, man. I've I just had thought a, you had to uh, I've, get it out. Yeah, I've had. We won't bore the listener with this, but I've had something of a day, and you know that. And now the listener mm-hmm. just sort of knows it. And if they want to, you know, understand what I mean by that, just go back and re-listen to what I just spent five minutes talking about. You'll be exhausted. So am I. Fuck you. There you go. Nice.
Not you, Tom. That's good. To, the listener. That's a nice something. <laughs> Thanks, Fuck man. The listener. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. You're great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. It's over you. Uh, it was a good. It was a good ten minute intro. Mm-hmm. What do you think? A good warm up. Yeah, man, I'm hot. I'm fucking, I'm firing in all cylinders right yeah, now. Yeah, you are. Mm. I'm looking through this edition of Wine Enthusiast to see if I can find any Zinfandel scores. It's going great. I think, I think I looked it up, they gave this like a 91 or something. That's, you know, I admire them giving a $20 bottle of wine that. A $21 bottle of wine. Which it totally deserves. Like, it's a fantastic bottle. Yeah. yeah. It's great. It's mm. delicious. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we had it, uh, it's, I'm really excited that we, that we, um, managed to get the same bottle. Yeah, we need to do this more often. We need to, you know. Yeah, yeah. But also to, um, the fact that we opened it, like we were going to do it yesterday and we didn't do it yesterday. And then we, you know, still opened it regardless and had a glass. So today we, we, you know, both have had the chance to, um, come back to it it with, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have it with two different meals as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yesterday it was like super Oh shit. Like Sorry. Right. Uh this well the 2018 version of the same bottle is in the buying guide as one of the um No, it's just in the buying guide for wine enthusiasts with mm. 90 points. Mm-hmm. Uh, this offering is blended with smaller amounts of petite Syrah, Carignan and mixed reds. Juicy and generous in blackberry and vanilla, it is broadly mm-hmm. appealing. It is a broadly appealing style, utilizing both American and French oak. Mm-hmm. Editor's choice: fourteen percent, fourteen point eight percent alcohol. The two thousand seventeen is also fourteen point eight percent, and uh, they list the price as twenty six dollars. But I got this for twenty one. So yeah, nice. I saved five bucks. I'm gonna go buy a biscuit. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just What's I that? just saw that and was distracted by it. Mm. Oh, I, I thought we were going to address the voice you just did. Oh, do you want to? No. I no, was doing no. like a half-assed impression of Joe Exotic. Oh, that's <laughs> what that was. Okay. Does he eat biscuits often? Not unless he can find them on the back of a truck. Yeah, no. I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. there's also the... Cortina that you were telling me about, right? Oh man, the Cortina is so fucking good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wine enthusiast gave the 2017 Cortina a 91. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And they also make an old vine. They Segacio yeah. has three. three their old vine's good. Yeah. yeah. And I, no, they're, I they're, their old vine's good, but their their Cortina is like is so. It's like super elegant and pretty and just delicious. That sounds great. Man. I don't know if it has lower alcohol content, but mm. whereas this oh, this is probably like right um, press wine, that's probably free run. Yeah, fifteen point five percent. The Cortina. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't taste like it. Uh, old wine, fifteen point six. Hmm. Yeah, but I mean at the same time, like it's it's supposed to be like that. It's like you you don't want a bottle of Amarone that's like. 11.5 percent alcohol no you know I mean? no you do not you just you just don't want that same time you don't also want to if somebody has a a maroni that's 11.5 percent alcohol don't buy it they're a warlock they're trying to summon the devil yeah. <laughs> mm. but uh yeah it's cool so, yeah so yesterday was like a lot kind of what they were saying it was like bigger and richer and like mm-hmm. um you could just taste a, like the american oak a lot more mm-hmm. and it was just kind of it was like just delicious and lush, you know. But then today, I, I like smelled it and was like, "Whoa, what, what the fuck happened to this?" And it's like, at least for me, this bottle is like I don't know what yours is like right now, but it's a lot, a lot like lighter and prettier and more like floral, and it it is pretty drastically different. Like it's almost like it's two different wines, um, but in a good way because it's yeah. like, oh wow, all right, well now I know. Like if I want this out of it, I'll just open it the day before and pour some it like you know, whatever, double decant it or something and just let it sit. Yeah, except for a certain plushness on the front end of the mm-hmm. palate, which is mm-hmm. very soft. Like, the tannins in this are where they exist. They're super fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, except for the plushness at the front end, which is a kind of giveaway that it's not that, the floral and, like, delicacy yeah. elements, the f- 
delicate floral elements to use mm-hmm. proper syntax, whatever. Um, like mm. on the nose. Mm-hmm. On on the nose, you might be able, if you blinded me, I. If you blinded me on this wine, smelling it, I would probably be, able to be tripped into thinking it was a Pinot. Mm-hmm. On the nose, that plushness on the palate might steer no, me yeah, away. The, the palate, yeah, yeah, because then it also has that like, chocolatey, yeah, like, richness. Like on on the palate, especially on the finish, it's like, I mean, one from the alcohol oh, content, yeah. but also like. Just because you know you're like, oh wow, this, this given this high alcohol, like, I don't, I don't think you could find a, a Pinot Noir at like whatever this is like fifteen percent alcohol. Yeah, that would. But it also doesn't be just like scream this. that it's almost fifteen percent alcohol. Like no, no, no. It like it, that, ha- um, it has a very good glide. Like it's got a lot of nice glycerol totally. elements to it. That that Saint Blanc, the Mary Edwards mm-hmm. one. Where I was like, this tastes like it's high alcohol. That was like fourteen point four, and that tasted yeah. like it was much higher alcohol than this. Mm-hmm. So, but I think like, you can get away with that with reds because there's other things to sort of distract you and support it, like you know, whatever tannins and mm. you know, anthocyanins like do huge work for you, yeah. masking alcohol. Like the development of phenolic character, like phenolics. Mm-hmm. I don't know what their relationship to alcohol, the alcohol molecule is, but certainly in your like in your perception of flavor they they let a lot mm-hmm. of it by hmm yeah <clears throat> yeah 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 Whew. well i think i remember um in that one wine chem book it's like the 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 presence of of higher alcohol as um so it's sort of like a positive feedback loop because one well, way i guess but the higher alcohol, the more you're able to just naturally extract from the wine. Yeah. Which then helps cover up the alcohol and, mm-hmm. you know, so on and so on. So that's how you can get these bigger wines that, if they're made right, you know, and made well. You know, just like, just beaten to shit and over extracted and everything. Um, or, a, a, yeah. Yeah, you can get away with Well, extracted but, I mean, pinots give you a headache because you're just drinking, like, these massive, weird tannin structures and then it's only, like, Twelve and a half percent. You're like, ah, eh, huh. yeah. That's why you want to be able to read fucking newspaper through a uh, Pinot Noir because, right? If it's got, yeah, if it's just got too much mm-hmm. of those clunkier molecules floating around in there, but no alcohol for those to like, kind of contend with. Mm-hmm. Just like, I don't know. It's like when you throw the acid balance of your stomach off, but just like in a glass. Hmm. Yeah. Nailed that analogy. Hmm. Case closed. <laughs> Throw away the keys, boys. I'm sorry. I'm contending with some very, very spicy pasta I made myself. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm. Nice. Mm. Uh, what else can we talk about? Zinfandel. Oh yeah, there is. I think it's it's origins or some like. Eastern, like Albanian or like weird Eastern European um, grape. Uh, mm-hmm. pe- pe- people were thinking for a while that, like, oh, it was the only, like, a Croatian, I think. Mm. Um, we're thinking it was the same as the Primitivo grape variety, uh, mm. which it is not. Um, it's not the same as Primitivo. And people are saying, oh, yeah, it's also, like, the only, like, native U.S. grape variety to, like, be commercially made. And it's not native to the U.S., so it's two letdowns. Wikipedia um, straight up redirects you from Primitivo to Zinfandel. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> oh no! Wait, the Primitivo? No, no, no. Primitivo is the same. Is the Primitivo the same thing? I thought it wasn't. It well might not be. Again, uh, Wikipedia. It's below two percent, but there is an error rate. Mm. And for any listeners who are interested. The error rate of the Encyclopedia Britannica is above two percent. So, you know, fuck all of your high school teachers who told you not to use Wikipedia as a source. Yeah, fuck them. No, I don't think that. Let me see this. I remember studying for that fucking. Yeah, they're not. They're different. They're different clones of the same grape called uh, Krolgenac some Croatian fucking thing but they're not the same 
Krilljanak. So, oh yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. But they're, oh, yeah, they're so. they're so DNA. Oh, I didn't even read the article. DNA analysis yeah, reveals nice. them to be gen- genetically equivalent, like both mm-hmm. those. Yeah. To uh, Krilljanak, Kistenelski, <laughs> Tribidrag. <laughs> yeah. As well as to the Primitivo yep. variety traditionally grown in Apulia, mm-hmm. the heel of Italy. Um, they're definitely similar. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, uh, uh, but Zinfandel, well, like, I mean, th- then the history section, like, of this article, it's like, it starts at 6,000 BCE, so, like, mm-hmm. it goes back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess... Pointing out that that they're different is more of like a technicality than anything. Like they're very fucking similar yeah. in terms of how they taste and everything. Um, but it's like I don't know. It's like they're two, they're clones of the same thing. So it's like mm-hmm. saying like I don't know, Pomard and Seven 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 are are different because one's grown in like New Zealand and one's grown in like France. And you're like, well, yeah, look, like they're look how different they are. And it's like if you took that clone and grew it over here, it'd probably be very similar. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Mm. So. Have we talked You're about clones about ass, much yet? No, no, we haven't. That would that would be good for. Uh, that's a whole episode. I mean, that's a whole. That's a whole. Yeah, it's a whole deal. It's like that'd be good for when we do Burgundy, and it's like, oh, we did Pinot already, but like whatever. It's not mm-hmm. the only fucking time we're ever gonna talk about Pinot. Anyway, it doesn't really fucking matter. But um, for all intents and purposes, um, Pinotage. No, not Pinotage. Goddamn. Primitivo and Zinfandel are the same thing. Pinotage is something else. Um, so this, I mean, let's fucking go into it because it's worth talking about. Oh, clones? Okay. Well, I mean, maybe from varietals down, like, how many clones there are. So this is a thing that I think people don't. There are levels of tasting rooms, right? And there are levels of wine drinking experience where you go there, mm-hmm. wine tasting experiences. You go to a wine tasting at a supermarket that, you know, is being run by some person who is a salesperson for the brand. They might have never met the winemaker. They just sell the wine, right? And they have a script, basically. They mm-hmm. have a fact sheet that they tell you about the wine. Um... That's one level. Then maybe you uh, you go to like a wine event where um, a bunch of wines of a similar varietal are being poured, but again by salespeople, but like more informed salespeople. Uh, and then you mm-hmm. actually start going to tasting rooms, and then you get like all this like jargon thrown at you about the the vineyard and the and the and the barrel program and all this other stuff. And then mm-hmm. you like maybe do a tasting with a winemaker like a barrel tasting in a winery and they you know select stuff that's not even in a bottle yet and show it to you and explain it and talk about you know how it's from some part of the vineyard and it's a certain clone or whatever of Mm -hmm. a certain grape um varietals i'm i'm trying to make this trying to make this work but i think i just fucked up so varietals are like varietals are like breeds of horses like all grapes are horses right but certain Mm -hmm. varietals are like arabians or clydesdales or whatever the fuck you know whatever kind of horse you want you know like mm-hmm. you say quarter horse you actually could mean several different types of horses in that because there's Clydesdales and other you know horses that are described as quarter horses I believe mm-hmm. I might be wrong about that but fuck it um, but <clears throat> but then you you have this whole like secondary thing where somebody's like oh well it's a thoroughbred and you're like well okay a thoroughbred means that that's a description of how pure its relationship to a varietal is so if you drink a wine that is 100 percent a given varietal that's like a thoroughbred but what is it a thoroughbred of so 
is it a thoroughbred Arabian? Then it might be like a Pinot Noir that's 100% Pinot Noir. Whatever. This mm-hmm. is all, you know, bordering on eugenics in the botanical and uh, animal husbandry worlds, but that's mm-hmm. just how these things are. Dog breeds would also right. probably work as an analogy. So you have these, yeah. like, broader categories that relate to these subcategories, but then the relationship of those categories can become confused. So you have stuff like Barbera and Barbaresco and Barolo. And Barbera and Barbaresco sound like kind of related as words, but it turns out Barbera is a varietal. Like, that's a type of grape. And Barbaresco is a subcategory categorization of wines that are primarily made out of Nebbiolo. So, Mm -hmm. and this, you know, is like... I'm adopting the assumption that whoever is listening to this doesn't know all of this. Like, maybe you do. I don't. I don't give a shit. Like, it's 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 complicated and confusing, and is worth talking about because you get down into the weeds of like. So you have all of these different sort of like naming histories where back in the day when Pinot Noir was grown in California before France got a stick up their ass, it was just called Burgundy because Pinot Noir is the varietal of Burgundy. Never mind that Beaujolais is like this weird dog leg onto Burgundy and all they grow there is Gamay. There's this whole like confusion of place names relating to varietals relating to mm-hmm. place names again. And so there's this whole yeah. like interplay, especially in the old world, of all of those things. So then when you get into... Um, so basic, I a, a metric that I would love to see someone actually do a paper on and... Um, and then I wouldn't read it because I don't read these things. But it would be it would validate my assumption that it's important. Um, mm-hmm. Would be using an analysis of how many different clones there are of different varietals to determine mm-hmm. which varietals are most valued. Because when it comes to like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, oh, I'm sure P- Pinot has to be number one. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And I think Chardonnay is right up there with it. Like there mm-hmm. are a bunch of clones of chardonnay yeah even though it's a relatively young varietal compared to Mm -hmm. a bunch of other stuff like aliote is apparently older than chardonnay um Hmm. but the thing that then you like have to wind back on is like okay well what is a clone compared to a varietal and a clone is a specific a specifically phenotypically separate vine like a vine Mm -hmm. that is like um it's like a blonde golden, like a, a a blonde golden retriever versus a golden golden retriever, right? Like you, it's the same dog, but there's like a small genetic variation that renders one of them, you know, blonde haired instead of gold or reddish haired, and mm-hmm. that's like what people are getting into with clones because the way that most, and this relates to the way most wine grapes are grown and how vineyards are set up, is you like. Uh, and it, again, don't know how much people who are listening to this know about this, but like <laughs> in the world of botany, almost all fruit plants are grown by grafting. Like you, you get a piece of scion wood, which is the piece of wood that you want the fruit from, and you slap that onto a um, in, onto a rootstock, and usually that rootstock is picked for some relationship it has to the soil types that you're dealing with or pathogens that you expect to attack the roots. Uh, and there's the whole history of phylloxera that has to do with wine. It's its own fascinating history that we should go into in some episode. Uh, there's a great mm-hmm. book called Phylloxera about it. Um, but basically all a thing worth knowing about wine grapes is that when someone says old vine or original vines, they're alluding to the idea of own rooting, which is vinifera rootstock. So the idea that the roots of the plant or vitis vinifera. Most wine that is grown in the entire world, the roots of that plant are not vitis vinifera. They are genetically separate from whatever is producing the fruit on top of the plant. And, you know, I that concept is one that I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like it's covered well enough in wine literature. Like, I don't think it's something that mm-hmm. people uh, are have explained to them. At a, at a useful moment in their like interest in wine but it's something that is very very important in like growing grapes is that 
it is much safer to plant a a well, and you you can plant the vine already growing like this. With the, you you take the one you know the scion that you want the the fruit producing part of the plant that you want and connect it to the root stock part that you want and put that in the ground and you'll get the plant that you want. But um, so when people say clones, they're talking about the top part of the plant, the scion, the 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 uh, the genetic code for what what is determining the character of the fruit and clonal variation is related to the fact that like you can in theory when someone talks about clones and they say something like 777 or 667 or or pomard the way that clone and the reason they call it cloning is because in theory the entire vineyard, if it's Pomard as the clone, is all genetically, in terms of what is producing the fruit, genetically identical. Every vine in that vineyard is gen genetically identical uh, to a single plant somewhere back in the history of Burgundy. Like, it's all yeah. the same. Because they're all clones of the same plant because cuttings from that plant got used to plant another vineyard and then cuttings from those plants got used to plant another vineyard and when you make cuttings and you use that to m make a scion for a, for a grafted plant the way that plants work is it maintains that genetic material and you end up with genetically identical wood um, in the plant and I don't know if that was actually like the m most concise or best way to describe that but it's like it's something it's it's truly magical. Like it's an amazing feat that plants are capable yeah. of. Um, but when you when you're talking about clonal variation, you're talking about like Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir being this plant that people care about so much that they like tried to grow it from seed, or there were so many different like valued sort of like vines that were all identified as Pinot Noir back in the day that cuttings existed from them, and they used those to graft these, um, you know scion rootstock plants out of and there is huge like diversity with pinot noir but then with something like uh, zinfandel i mean it's so it's so like sort of shallow in how much clonal diversity it is i guess that they you know and maybe that's not even true but like the the history goes so far back that primitivo was considered to be this completely separate thing until someone came along with, you know, a PCR machine and showed them to be gene genetically, you know, more or less indistingu indistinguishable. That does not take away from the fact that the winemaking traditions around them completely diverged for centuries. And that means that they are, like, functionally different wines. Which goes back to, like, the same grape grown in different regions can be called something completely different. And it is functionally something that, say you were a, a master psalm, you would be expected to know the difference between um, yeah tell me to stop talking anytime <laughs> i'm just uh you're having a good one today um, aren't you man man you're really <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean those are all um i think cogent points so yeah, i you know yeah it's just something that it's like I don't know. It's very easy to get a job in the wine industry without having a conception of all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And, like, you don't... Yeah. I mean, it's easy to because you don't really need it. Oh, no, you and don't need it no, at all. Nobody no, really yeah. expects you to know it. And then if you do, it's like, wow, that's crazy. Well, and the, the it's problem like, is then people use that knowledge to lord it over other people. They, oh, God, it's the worst. Yeah. yeah. Like, this there's always someone in a tasting room making someone else feel like shit for not knowing everything they know about. I know. And it's probably just to cover up their own fucking insecurity about the whole thing anyway. Mm, yeah. I don't have any and insecurities just... that I'm trying to cover up. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Nobody does. Yeah. No, man. I mean, it's... um. I don't know. It's uh, That's a whole other fucking... <laughs> it's a mm. wine culture sucks episode fucking two three four five it's a whole series 
But um, yeah, no, I mean, I love this. Uh, I have this script. I mean, I feel like we've already talked about so much of this just because. Um, I don't know. I, I love this a lot. And uh, oh yeah, yeah. So I went to. This, this is actually a good time to talk about this. I went to this one of the this tasting in New York like last year, and it was like I don't know, forty different Zen producers. I was telling you about it yeah. last night a little bit. Um, and there was a whole bunch of people there. It wasn't like everybody, but they didn't have um, like Bedrock as the big one, one of the big like sexy producers, you know. Yeah. Um, and there, I almost got a bottle of their stuff, but um, I didn't because uh, part of me was kind of like wanting to tell like the hot new kid like fuck you like I don't want to not that they're like brand new but like maybe about five years ago or you know seven years ago they really like blew up in terms of popularity and stuff uh, and like their ones are great you know yeah. but Sagusi is not like a super they're not as as well known as not that they're not well known but they're not as like they're very established you know they're like yeah, I, yeah. The, and one of the great things like, about like it's the reason we're both drinking it you can get this bottle most places yeah yeah and but it's not like like you can get a bunch of uh ridge yeah yeah. which are which are delicious you can get Mm -hmm. those but they're expensive yeah and like this is it's it seems like it's a very modest wine in a lot of ways and it kind of like out like over over delivers or performs what you think it would so yeah um yeah yeah and the, the wines are delicious so you know we were there and there was a whole there was a bunch of there were a bunch of producers the only ones that i had there were a couple that i knew already but um ridge was there mm-hmm. and uh Tsugisi was right next to them you know typically at those tasting is it's like whatever yeah. there'll be like the big famous person there's a huge line to taste the, whatever the famous yeah. person's wine and on both sides of them like nobody be be trying that stuff but you know where so we were there and i wanted to try uh i think they had like a uh have you had any of the ridge Sinfandels? i believe i have but most of the opportunities I've had to try Ridge are in context where I like was trying a bunch of other shit as well. Oh um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, they have they have a bunch of them. They have. Yeah. Um, well, that's the other problem with Ridge is like there are they make so many different wines. Like they're they make so many wines. Their um, yeah. their their wines are really good, and they're they're I don't know. I think they're consistently kind of worth the price that they command like ridge has a bunch of stuff below like 70 bucks that i think is like admirable wine uh Mm -hmm. at least everything i've tried but like but then i think they also have a bunch of stuff that's like wow they make 17 different zinfandels jesus christ oh my god well but but one of the things that is cool about them is like they they like a lot of their skews have to do with vineyard designates which is cool yeah yeah well that's the thing though they're all not all of them, but like a lot of them are all single vineyard ones, and there are, um, or like single block, or uh, there's one that's like three valleys, which is like a blend, but you know, mm. all the other ones are like, oh, York Creek Vineyard, or Pagani Ranch Vineyard, or Geyserville, you know, all that kind of shit. Yeah. But um, they're not all of them are super expensive, but I think they had like a Geyserville from like 2010, and they were pouring out, and like it was delicious. Yeah, you know? cool. like, yeah, it was great. And then, yeah, right next, right next to them were the Segisio, and that's ones that you yeah. know, like we had, we had had together like a bunch of times. We're like, oh, it's great, yeah, let's try these, let's try their other wines. And they were pouring this. They were pouring, I think, their uh, Rock Pile, mm-hmm. which is a different AVA, I think. No, it's a uh, yeah, yeah. I think it, it's within. It's like a sub AVA, and um, and then they had their Old Vine, and they had the Cortina. And the Cortina was, I mean, all the wines were delicious, but the Cortina was, like, so much better than everything else. Like, so much better than any of the Ridge wines, mm. which was pretty crazy because um, they're, like, fucking big dick on campus. I mean, I'm for, for context for anyone listening, Ridge goes back, like, deep into the history of, like, why people care about California wine to begin with. Yeah. Like, yeah. They're not, you know like uh a uh, ridge montebello wine mm-hmm. was um that and stag's leap cellars i believe 
because there's Stag Leap mm -hmm. Cellars and Stag Leap, Stag's Leap Winery, and I forget which one's which. One of them is the one that mm -hmm. AVA is named after. The other one is the one that went to the Judgment of Paris. Oh, yeah, yeah. The other wine. The other, so the re, the white wine at the Judgment of Paris was a Chardonnay from Chateau Montalena. The mm -hmm. red wines that beat out Bordeaux were um, Stag's Leap and... Um, Stag Leap and Ridge Montebello, mm -hmm. uh, Cab Sauve, I believe, not Zinfandel, but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But yep. but, but just in terms yeah, of like crazy. you know what a big dick Ridge is swinging around, which you know like, yeah yeah yeah. Hats off to them. Their wines are fucking amazing. Like I'm not like, yeah. I haven't had any of their cabs before. I really <sighs> yeah want to have them. They're great. But, They're uh, really really good. Yeah yeah yeah. But at least the ones that I've are they tried. But. Are they? I mean, I imagine they're pretty well structured. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Like, do they? Is it like a big barrel presence? Like, what are they? Um. Is it like you, you can't touch them for? I mean, ten years, I've, fifteen. I years, don't think I've gotten or? to try any kind of young ones. At least mm -hmm. in my and oh, cool. my memories about those mm -hmm. things are kind of hazy, but. Um. Yeah. But the thing about both cabins in, and it's part of you know the American oak profile on this really working for it is both of those varietals, especially out of Napa are such fruit prominent wines. Like mm -hmm. the fruit is, it can handle a lot of oak. So even if there is a lot of oak, you're not like, like you, their wines, especially like, uh, I don't know. Cab can be just so confusing this way where like, you can be like, wow, there's so much oak in this, but also the fruit is so pronounced that like, Mm -hmm. I, I, it works. I don't know. But like, yeah, yeah. Um, and Zinfandel can do that, I think, to some degree as well. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, th I feel like Zinfandel suffers for the, like, aplomb that, uh, or the, 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 the like, um, the, I've never understood it, but everybody f fucking, you know, loves Cab Sauv. Mm -hmm. and Zinfandel would it be inaccurate to describe Zinfandel as the gamay to Cab Sauv being Pinot Noir uh yeah I think so I think but like I don't think anybody is like anybody's offered I think it's even more exaggerated yeah because yeah. because people aren't like like offended by gamay you know if anything now it's like cool to be into Gamay because like oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I like I like Cru Beaujolais like there's a super cool tiny producer who does this weird carbonic thing and it smells like feet and I love it yeah like, oh awesome you know like, you try it and like the more disgusting it is the the cooler it is you know yeah and but Zinfandel it's like people would just shit on it because what because of pink or no white Zinfandel I think right yeah um, but people are thing, making you know, white Pinot these days like who gives a shit about any of that stuff like if it's good I it's know, good I know, but there's but... this there's this kind of thing that's left over where you know it's it's like anybody who you know whatever 20 years ago or 25 years ago if somebody was like oh yeah do you want chardonnay they're like oh yeah and it was expected to be like oaky and buttery and now if yeah. you go anywhere the first thing that you have a chardonnay the first thing you tell somebody who you're, you're pouring it for somebody you're trying to sell it to somebody or give it to somebody they're like no it's not a big oaky buttery thing so yeah. like still for fucking like 25 years you've been trying to like re-educate people and so it's the same thing now where it's like yeah it's uh i don't know wine's weird in that sense where like nobody won't, it's there's this stupid inferiority thing and then everybody yeah. doesn't want to seem like an idiot and it's like it's just when you go to the store to buy like i don't know like orange juice or something when you go to like if you just go to a bar and get a beer like people aren't you know it's not it's not a test well it depends on the bar you go to on the bar yeah that's true yeah. no it's it's the great thing about um i it's one of the reasons i'm really grateful that i like started drinking beer on the east coast because mm -hmm. there's not the same sort of beer culture there is on the west coast now with beer mm -hmm. like you've got like basically every every bar in boston has allagash mm -hmm. on tap and mm -hmm. no one rags on allagash because that beer's fucking great and no one wants to be like yeah. the cool kid like like it, it provides you this alternative to like 
like it is regional like you can't do that you can't get allagash on the west coast mm-hmm. but you know you're not drinking pbr which i don't know i hang out with a lot of people who are like really kind of insufferable to drink wine with at times who all chug oh, yeah. pbr yeah. like there's no tomorrow <laughs> because they reject right. the beer culture that exists around them and then they call that pretentious and it's like god damn it like everyone yeah. has their like way of being like signaling i'm not pretentious by drinking something and then being like mm-hmm. oh but i, I want to you know take this other thing super seriously and it's like, ah, fuck. yeah yeah it's it's an it's annoying it's just yeah. people want to have People want, to be cool. know, people want to have control yeah. and like have authority yeah. on something. Yeah. For anyone listening to this, we're not drinking Zinfandel to be cool and deferential. We're drinking it because we like it. Because <laughs> we like it. We don't um, have any problems with ourselves or our self-image. <laughs> that is propaganda. No, mental health. They have. Yeah. <laughs> Those are slander campaigns yeah, yeah. being mounted by Russia against our if character. I need to make... All of my recent cover letters for uh, writing positions in the wine industry public, I'll do it. Mm. I have no, uh, I got nothing to hide here, partner. I have, I have everything to hide. I want to hide everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man. I hide it all. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. No, the, I, there's this it's weird. There is this Delicious. weird cultural like. This weird cultural. I mean, a great example would be like, oh, well, uh, Jancis Robin. This this is a thing I told you about in the past. Jancis Robinson participates in it, where she like has this rubric for how long different varietals are supposed to age. Yeah. And on it, she says like Pinot Noir can age for six to eight years, but then lower down, she yeah. says that Grand Cru Burgundy can age for twenty five years to however long, and it's like right, right. All Grand Cru Burgundy is Pinot Noir. You're mm-hmm. you're you're furthering people's confusion. There are Pinot Noir producers in the rest of the world. God forbid the New World, you know the the mm-hmm. big air quotes around it New World, who make Pinot Noir that can yeah. completely contend with Grand Cru Burgundy in terms of quality. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the considerations that actually drive the winemaking style towards something that will not age as stably and as long have to do with Mm -hmm. how vicious the market is because of people saying shit like that. Right. And, you know, nobody's going out and buying Oregon Pinot Noir or New Zealand Pinot Noir or Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir being like, I'm going to put this in the cellar for 25 years and just see what happens. Whereas people are going out and buying Grand Cru Burgundy and be like, I have to put this in a cellar for 25 years or else it won't be good. So I will have to wait. Mm -hmm. And, and that's somebody with the money to not only buy Grand Cru, you know, Burgundy, but to have some sort of interest in a hobby that they're not really going to see the payoff on for 25 years. That's somebody who has so much money that they're able to pretend that they're like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to spend the next 25 years developing a taste profile and attitude to really appreciate that thing I bought and set aside in the cellar. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, prove it to me. Go buy a bunch of like $27, $28 bottles of wine and figure out why they're Mm -hmm. good. And you know what's, you know why you're not going to do that? Because then Mm -hmm. in 25 years, you're going to be underwhelmed by the thing you bought because like, it'll be great. It'll be amazing, but you'll have had Mm -hmm. amazing bottles of wine for 30 bucks and you'll feel yeah. like an asshole for being the most preposterously <laughs> overblown example of why capitalism is this hollow horrifying <laughs> soul crushing <laughs> demonic force that we've all just sort of capitulated to man again really on one today tom i am yeah i can tell man this is uh this is a good one Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is going to be the kind of thing uh, where, like, if if this gets off the ground, mm-hmm. like, I'm just going to be, I'm, I'm going to be such, if this gets off the ground, I just, I'm not looking forward to having to reflect on, like, people saying, like, hey, yeah, I really like listening to you, your podcast. It was like, oh, like. Yeah, because, like, because, you know, it's informative or, like, 
I don't know. What, like, why would you listen to? I mean, Tom's great. He's like very like calm and thoughtful, but like <laughs> that's me. It's just like I don't know, man. I just like I don't. <laughs> you know how you get to a certain point with something like loving something where you. I love nothing. Well, it, yeah, and nobody. Yeah, yeah. I know Tom. I know. Yeah. Keep telling yourself that. <laughs> Actually, don't. It'd be helpful if you told yourself something else, maybe. <laughs> like, okay. you know, I'll tell myself. Uh, I don't know. I'll work on just, it. Anyway. Just tell yourself you love something until you do, and then you know. Mm. Ooh, that's it. Will it into existence? Yeah. Into being? Yeah. Why not? Nice. Why not? Tell yourself you love wine. Like, who's got anything to lose? It's you know. right. Yeah. It's like loving a person. Like, you love it despite the fact that it's full of faults and mostly bullshit. But, like, hey, you just, like, hang on to the things that are really just make you feel like there's some effervescent glory to life that, you know, if you ever described it perfectly, you would immediately have killed it. So, uh,. Nah, man, I, that, <laughs> fuck me, fuck all of what I just said, yep. fuck everything. So, uh, no, uh, yeah, there, some of the, uh... there, there was a, there was a real thing, and I forgot, or not a real thing, like a, a dumbass. Some of the oldest vines in the U.S. Yeah, there's are, Zinfandel. Uh, there's, all Zinfandel. All Zinfandel, yeah. yeah. Pre-prohibition bullshit. Yeah, the, yeah, Bedrock has, uh, speaking of them, they yeah. have some old, they got some old fuckers, you know? Mm-hmm. Um... And those wines would be cool to try. I think they're really expensive, but I haven't. I've had, I've only had. Uh, maybe, I, I, maybe I had a bottle of their old vine stuff, but I haven't had any of their like, uh, like ancestor. I don't know yeah, what the fuck it's original vine specifically called, like in, something like that. Yeah, uh, some, some pretentious name. Bedrock wine. I'll look her up. Per the uh, yeah. The t- oh, I, I hate this, I hate these of. kinds of websites already. I was trying to think of some. There's some, like, fuck, what was it? Yeah, man. Yep, that's it. Just, I, like. What does that even mean, on the wines of a pig? What the fuck does that mean? On the wines of a pig? Do they mean, like, on the wings of a pig? Oh, wings, not wines. I misread that because I was looking at wine making below that. Like I want to know what fuck what the fuck oh, wines you make. Oh fuck like, them! So no, that's bullshit. bullshit. No, on the wings of a pig is a reference to John Steinbeck. Yeah. Ah. God damn it! Purchasing me? Like I know everyone. Okay, okay like, so why is just it for whoever's listening? Um, I know everyone's like when pigs fly is a phrase, right? But like John Steinbeck, particularly would like he had this like seal made for himself or something, which was something along the lines of like. Odd Astra and something Porcini or like it, Stein Steinbeck had this like motto that was to the stars on the wings of pigs that 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 is a reference to. Yeah. I think eighteen ninety six is when they yeah were their old oldest vines I think Odd Austri per alla porci. Alla porci. Yeah, alla porci, which um, I'm pretty sure is like... We'll get you there. Yeah, nah, man. Alla porci. <laughs> yeah, You're getting better. Yeah. You gotta keep watching more Sopranos. Yeah. And you'll get it down. Um, yeah, Steinbeck, I think that's like on, in the frontispiece of like East of Eden. Hmm. Yeah. Dude, like, I hate when I go to somebody's fucking website... And I'm like, I can't find the the simple thing that I'm looking for. Like, yeah. I, I don't feel like going yeah. to like going onto a, a winery's website to be like, oh, what wines do you make? That that's a reasonable question, right? I mean, yeah, it, it is. I, I feel like it is. You know, yep. um, I can look up the different vintages. I can meet the people who own the place. I can look like, the vineyards, grower profiles, the A team, friends and influences. Cool. The A team. Glad you care about where it's coming from. B.A. Barack is, is making their wines? I think so, Badass, yeah. Badass, man. No, Co- Cody and Luke are. Cody, Luke, Jake, Sarah, Kristen, Jackie. Like, these these are... It's a lot uh, of people. It's a lot of... Uh, uh, it sounds like a pretty diverse team they got there. 
<laughs> Cody and Luke, you know, right away, boom. I mean... <laughs> I mean... Uh, <laughs> I don't... Yep. You have one guy's right in nope. one of the Gospels, the other guy's... Cool Doing dude. a keg stand. <laughs> keg stand, exactly. Uh, yeah, what is it? It takes friends and influences on here. Uh, Sekisio's not on here. Mm. Hate to break it to you, but... Copain is. Carson is. Uh, Turley is. <sighs> oh, yeah, but Turley. Okay, so other others inside from this. Um, Ridge makes some some good ones. They're they're big. They're, they're kind of like opulent and mm -hmm. like oak usage. There, I mean, I think um, the one I had, I think I had like a 2016 guys reveal or something. I just think it just needed time to sort of like resolve because it, it felt sort of like um, not closed off, but it, it seemed like it was kind of packed in. It was like a brick, you know, like it was just like a like a like a closed dictionary where you're like, all right, this is cool. There's a lot of stuff in here that I like know I can access, but it's just not like I can't open the book yet. Mm. So yeah. I feel like it just needs yep. time to be able to open up a little bit. And you're like, oh, wow, this is, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be as complex as a fucking dictionary, but. Holy that's, shit. Uh, Turnley makes maybe it's more like a, like a Dr. Seuss. from over 50 vineyards. Who does? Turley. Oh, Turley makes a ton of wines. Jesus Christ. But yeah, so, so then Turley is like, if you took this and you just cranked up the dial, it's a lot bigger. Yeah. Um... Rattlesnake Ridge is uh, is uh, one of their one of their their bigger ones, or the other Howl Mountain. Is in, uh, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot. The Juvenile is their one you can find pretty easily, and it's a it's a good value. Um, Rattlesnake Ridge is expensive, um, but um, if you can find it uh, in a good price, sure, get it. But I think Turley Juvenile is let's see what is it? It's like thirty bucks Juvenile. around. Um, yeah, I mean, you can find it for less than that. You can find it for more than that. But on average, it's about 30. Huh. And uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it's delicious. It's great. It's super fun. And um, yeah, yeah 30 or under 30. And I mean, it's, it's a ton of fun. And it's like, don't, you know, you have, if you are just going to have a glass of it, you need to like, like really big wines. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you can't just, you know. But if you're going to have it with something like, I don't know, ribeye or the lamb chops or I don't know anything big you know boar if you're going to eat boar you know I don't know just any, anything that's like big enough like you can't have like fish with it or like mm -hmm. a like a late squab or something <laughs> you know it's got to be something that's like can fucking fight with it you know yeah. something that when it was alive would be a difficult to kill <laughs> Mm, like not lovely. just like oh i can't i can't catch up to this thing it's too fast like it would be yeah. it would be if it was not happy if it didn't want you to kill it it would be scared to kill it yeah it'd be scared yeah. to, kill it, to yeah. try to kill it that's probably I, uh, what would go better oof. with a, a bigger wine yeah gotta be honest Literally. i have some yep. disturbingly vivid experiences with exactly what you're talking about nice yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you told me about that. Or one of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Indeed. You shouldn't have killed that poor uh, clerk. Yeah. And then ate him. He didn't deserve that. He was just, he didn't. He was just trying to tell you which kiosk to use at the self-checkout section of Walmart. And you just... Hunted him down. Didn't eat lunch. You were hangry, and you decided to murder and eat him. Yeah. So. And I did. <laughs> Turley was delicious. With a delicious bottle of wine. Yeah. It's <laughs> that line from... Uh, well, from that sounds delicious. Yeah, with, uh, with fava beans like, and a lovely bottle of yeah, Chianti. Yeah, Chianti. Yeah, but he doesn't even yeah. say Chianti right. He says Chianti. Chianti? Chianti. Yeah. Chianti. I don't know. That movie wasn't as scary as I thought it was going to be. No, it's, it's a... It's a good movie. No, it's, it's certainly a good movie. But everyone was like, "Oh, it's terrifying!" It's like, like the guy's creep. The guy's scary. Yeah. You know. But it's. Yeah, it's a weird. It's a like, everyone gives a like a lot of credit to how incredible Anthony Hopkins' performance is, and it is mm -hmm. very good. 
But yeah, a huge part of why his performance is so good is because of how incredible Jodie Foster's 